Hello everybody, welcome back. So I'm just picking up right around where we left off in the previous video, where we went through and we meticulously filled out all of the blank cells in this output. The next thing now is really, let's try to make some sense of all of it. So we've already gone through and have obtained our estimated regression equation. This is really the main reason for doing regression analysis is to get that estimated regression equation. Then we can start to learn from that equation a little bit more about the relationship between our chosen independent variables and our dependent variable. So let's go through where we've done part a, so let's look at part B. Interpret each of the estimated coefficients and the corresponding interval estimates. Okay, so let's go through these one at a time. Let's start with this coefficient on price. I have negative 7.84. So one of the first things that I see or that I can comment on here is that I have a negative relationship between my dependent variable, which in this exercise, this was a demand equation. So my dependent variable here is quantity. Maybe to make that a little bit more clear, I can change this to a quantity. So if you've taken an introductory economics course, you probably expect that there's going to be a negative relationship between quantity demanded and the product's own price. And so that's what we see here. I've got a negative relationship. Okay, now what does the number actually mean? Because I know that I often have students when asked to interpret that coefficient tend to really just focus on the sign, but that's just part of the bigger picture. Yes, it's a negative relationship, but that number is really useful. So in order to properly interpret that number, I need to remind myself, what are our units? What are we talking about here? What are the units that our variables are being measured in? So I'm going to come back up here and I see prices are in dollars. So I have two prices, its own price and some related good. Advertising and income are in thousands of dollars. Okay, so when those change by one unit, that's a thousand dollars. But my prices, a one unit change is just gonna be one dollar. Now, as far as quantity goes, I don't have anything here that says specifically what quantity is. It could be measured in hundreds, it could be thousands, it could be millions. But because there's nothing here that is giving me any specific uh, unit, I'm just going to assume that quantity is just in, in the raw number. So 10 is 10. It's not in millions. It's not in thousands. 10 is just 10 units. Okay, and I'm making that assumption only because there's nothing else here. It just simply says the quantity of quantity sold. Okay, so if I come down here, I see negative 7.84 is that coefficient. So what that means is that a one unit change in price, that one unit is $1. So a $1 change in price, let's think about an increase in price because that's just easier for me, that's easier to think in terms of positive changes rather than negative changes. So a $1 increase in price corresponds to a reduction, because it's negative, a reduction in quantity demanded by 7.84 units. Okay, so I'm, I'm breaking that down. A $1 increase in price, so that's a one unit increase in price, corresponds with a reduction, because it's negative, in quantity demanded of 7.84 units. Now, if quantity was in millions, I would say 7.84 million units, but I don't have that, it's just in units, okay? So then the next one. Now we're looking at the price of a related good. So, if you've taken an economics class, you might look at that coefficient and see, oh, that's negative. 
So if the price of this related good Y increases, there's a negative relationship. So this good becomes more expensive. The quantity demanded of this goods go down. That indicates a complementary relationship. This isn't an economics course. This is a statistics course. So I'm not going to dwell on that. But you might be inclined to say something to that effect if you've taken that course and if you've got that background. Here, all I will say is, again, I'm going to talk about $1 increases because that's easy to wrap my head around. A $1 increase in the price of this related good, whatever it is, this complement, a $1 increase in the price of this related good leads to a decrease in quantity demanded of this good of 10.14 units. So again, if I'm thinking about this in the economic sense, if these are complements, I'm thinking about um, hot dogs and buns, right? A hot dog, a wiener, and a bun, those are complements, they go together. Or hamburger and a bun. Um, or coffee and sugar, or um, rum and coke. These are complements, these are things that go together. So if the price of rum increases by $1, quantity demanded of coke will fall by 10.14 units. Okay, so you can think, again, depending on what your background is, if you have knowledge, if you have a background of economics, you can interpret it in that sense. Typically in a statistics class, that's not necessarily a requirement. Just to simply understand that if the price of that good increases by a dollar, quantity demanded of this good, X, will fall, because it's negative, will fall by 10.14 units. Now, we're into advertising. So I have to remember here, advertising and income, these are measured in thousands of dollars. So when I talk about a one unit increase, here I'm talking about a $1,000 increase, because that's how it's measured. So once again, advertising, I have here a positive relationship with quantity demanded. Well, that's good. I would hope to have a positive relationship. I spend more on advertising. It's nice to see that quantity demand that is increasing. If quantity demand that is falling in response to my increased advertising, maybe I need to rethink my advertising strategy. So a $1,000 increase in advertising expenditure leads to an increase in demand, quantity demanded by 7.82 units. Okay, so a $1,000 increase in advertising, because that's one unit, is $1,000. A $1,000 increase, or you could say for every $1,000, uh, every additional $1,000 that we spend on advertising, quantity demanded will increase by 7.82 units. Similarly on income, positive relationship. Those of you with an economics background will see that that means that this is called a normal good, that income goes up, demand goes up, they're moving in the same direction, that's a normal good. Negative would be inferior good, yeah? So here, for every additional $1,000 in household income, demand increases, demand increases by 5.1 units. Okay, so for every additional $1,000 in income, quantity demanded increases by 5.1 units. Okay, and then if we go through the intervals, again, I'm not going to go through all of them because you'll get tired of hearing me repeat myself. So let's just go through a couple. So here we have on its own price. So we had that point estimate, right, for each additional um, $1 increase in price, we saw that quantity demanded fell by 7.84 units. Well, I'm 95% confident that the every additional dollar increase in price will reduce quantity demanded by between 11.45 and 4.23 or 4.24, okay? So I'm just interpreting that interval the same way that we would interpret any other interval, except that this is a, a, a interval estimate for a marginal effect. So I'm preceding that, that interpretation of the interval by saying for each additional dollar, or if we increase the price by $1, right? Because 
we're talking about a marginal effect. So I increase the price by a dollar. My point estimate is that demand will fall by 7.84 units. My interval estimate is that demand will fall by between 11.5 and 4.24. I'm rounding a little bit. Okay. Same thing for price of related good. If the price of that other good increases by a dollar, demand for this product will fall by 10.14 units. I'm 95% confident that if the price of that other good increases by a dollar, demand for our product will fall by between 14.8 and 5.5 units. We're good. For every additional thousand dollars that we spend on advertising, my point estimate is that demand will increase by 7.8 units. I'm 95% confident that demand will increase by between 4.1 and 11.5 units. Income. Okay, I said I wasn't going to do them all. Here I am doing them all. For each additional $1,000 in household income, demand, my point estimate, demand will increase by 5.1 units. I'm 95% confident that demand will either decrease by one unit or increase by 11.2 units. So I'm 95% confident that the change in quantity demanded is between negative one and 11.2. That of course sounds a little bit funny. And you understand why that sounds funny. Because like so many other things that we have done, and so now we're moving on, uh, I'm gonna move on to part D next looking at these significance tests, because here we see a relationship between that interval and the corresponding test. So all of those individual parameter significance tests, they all take this form where we're looking at each individual coefficient, so I'm calling this beta i, Beta i, i can be 1. Well, i can also be 0, actually. Although I'm just less interested in whether or not the intercept is different from 0, but certainly i is 0, 1, 2, 3, or in this case up to 4. So these are tests on individual parameter significance. So these are all the t-tests. And so they're all two-tailed t-tests. So that relationship between the confidence interval and the results of the test are all consistent for the same reasons that they were going back to module nine. If the hypothesized value exists within the interval, then that supports the null hypotheses. If the hypothesized value exists outside of the interval, that supports the alternative. Here in all of our tests, the hypothesized value is zero. So if I go back and I look at all of our intervals, well, oops, this first one, everything is positive, right? Zero is not there. Well, that supports the alternative. So too does a p-value of zero. That leads us to reject. Similarly here, everything's negative, no zero. That's consistent with the rejection. Same here. Same here, everything's positive in that advertising. But then this one here, we see we have a negative and a positive. So zero exists within that interval. Well, that supports the null hypotheses, which we also see with that p-value. That p-value is gonna lead us for income to not reject. So if I were doing this on an exam, I would tend to avoid going through each one individually, stating it. Uh, the null and alternative, and test statistic, p-value, all of that. I like to lump these together. Here's the ones that are significant. Here's the ones that are not. So I would look at these results for the individual t-tests, and I would say we have evidence to show that the product's own price, the price of the related good, and advertising are all statistically significant predictors of quantity demanded. They are all significantly related to quantity. However, we have evidence to show that household income is actually not statistically significant as a predictor of quantity demanded. Demand for this product is not related to income. 
So rather than going through each one individually, I'm lumping them together. Here are the ones that are found to be significant. Here's the one, or ones, because maybe I'll have more than one. In this example, here's the one that is found to be not statistically significant. Because I am not rejecting, right, for income, I am not rejecting, which means that it is not statistically different from zero, which means it doesn't belong in that model. So what I would actually do in reality is I would take this out and I would re-estimate this model. I'm not going to do that here. But that in its own is an interesting finding, that demand for this product is unrelated to income. Okay, so that's it. We've gone through our intervals, our individual tests. What about the test for overall model significance? Well, that's our F test. And that F test, well, here I have beta 1. We don't include beta 0 in here only those partial slopes because those are what are tied to our variables and when we talk about our model we talk about this f test is a test for overall significance of the model when we talk about the model i'm talking about the variables that we have chosen to include in the model i don't i'm not concerned with the y-intercept just the variables and so those variables are represented in the model they're related to the model through their coefficients. So here I have our four partial slopes. The null hypothesis is that they're all, st all simultaneously equal to zero. The alternative, not all of them are zero. So of course, this is different from what we saw in the module 14, right? In module 14, we saw that the F test was identical to the corresponding t-test. The tests were identical. We knew there was a relationship between the t-statistic and the f-statistic, and the p-value was identical. Well, here now, that relationship doesn't hold anymore because I have multiple t-tests and still just this one f-test. So this is a test to see whether or not all of our variables taken together are statistically significant. The answer to the question is, we reject, not all of them are zero. So that doesn't mean that they're all non-zero. It means that not all of them are zero. It might mean that some of them are. But what we have found here is that our model taken as a whole, our model taken together, all of these variables, price, its own price, price of the other products, advertising and income together, capture a statistically significant amount of the variation in quantity demanded. So together, they're significant. Individually, we found that they're all significant except income, which means, again, as, as tests for individual parameter significance, what this means is that given, given what these variables have to contribute in explaining variation and quantity demanded, Given what the other variables can contribute to explaining quantity demanded, does income have anything unique to contribute? And the answer here is no. It does not contribute anything unique beyond that which is already captured, which is already explained in those other parameters. Okay, And that's true for any of the tests. That way of thinking about these tests, if I look at the test on Px, well, what that test is saying is given what the price of related goods, advertising, and income, given what those three variables together have to contribute in explaining quantity demanded, does the product's own price have anything unique, anything additional to contribute? And there the answer is yes. I reject that null hypothesis. That variable is statistically significant on its own. M money or income not statistically significant. It does not contribute anything meaningful. Okay, good. So we're done D. Let's actually go back now, interpret the R squared. So here we're going to come back up here. 
We're going to look at this R squared, 0.68. Remember how that's calculated. That, of course, is SSR over SST. So that tells me that my chosen independent variables explain 68% of the total variation in quantity demanded. So that's a decent fit. It's not great, but it's not awful. It's kind of a medium quality fit. My regression, my, my chosen independent variables, so I would say specifically the product's own price, this other product's price, advertising and income together, explain 68% of the variation in quantity demanded. Now, of course, you're thinking, Peter, why aren't you interpreting the adjusted R-square? Well, the adjusted R-square, given this calculation, I can't accurately interpret it as a percentage. The adjusted R-square gives me a measure of, of how well my independent variables fit that, that data, how well they capture the variation in my dependent variable. But the adjusted R squared, it's always going to be less than the R squared. And it's better, it's more useful for when we're comparing different iterations of the model. So if I'm trying to improve my model, so maybe here I might think, okay, income is not statistically significant. I'm going to remove income from my model. I'm going to re-estimate this equation. I'm going to re-estimate this model without income. Then I can compare my two models, and there I would compare the adjusted R squared. And presumably, I would see the adjusted R squared would increase once I remove that insignificant variable. So the adjusted R squared on its own is less valuable than it is for the purpose of comparing different variations of your model when you're trying to find just that best model. Okay, I think we've gone through everything. Good, that's it. So I hope that this was helpful. We'll have a couple of other exercises to go through, and we'll probably see some complications come up in the future models. This one, believe it or not, was the easier of the examples. Okay, thank you all for watching. Take care. Bye-bye.